Hello, everybody. This is Dr. Beter. Today is April 24, 1976, and this is my monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 11. This year of 1976 is, of course, our bicentennial, the 200th anniversary of the founding of our beloved country. It should be a time for reflection on our hard-won, unique heritage and for thankful celebration of it. At the same time, it is only fitting that we also look ahead and give some thought to our future destiny and that of our trusting children. But on all sides we Americans are being bombarded with propaganda enticing us to focus only on the future without bearing in mind the lessons of the past. Bicentennial programs and articles dealing with our nation's early days keep the spotlight narrowly focused on the revolution itself. Most of the time, instead of on the wonderful free republic that was the product of that revolution. This is no accident. It is intended to gradually make us more revolution minded in order to make the so called Second American Revolution, being promoted by John D. Rockefeller III, seem more and more acceptable to us. The wise first president of our republic, George Washington, left us with advice in his farewell address that was so forward-looking that it is still valuable today, and time after time he referred to experience as, quote, the surest standard, unquote, by which to judge existing and planned governmental measures. This stands in stark contrast to the approach that is preached regularly by the man who wants to preside over the end of our free republic. Nelson Rockefeller. He keeps saying, quote, Forget the past and let's look to the future. Unquote. To what sort of future does Nelson Rockefeller ask us to look if it has nothing to do with our past? It is the future that was spelled out as early as 1924 by the father of Nelson and his brothers, John D. Rockefeller, Jr., in a talk to a group of students. John, Jr. was quoted by his attorney, agent, and biographer, Raymond B. Fosdick, as saying on that occasion, and I quote, We are standing tonight on the mountaintop with the world spread out at our feet. Your country, your country, my country, all of us. So it may come to pass that someday, someday, the people of all nations will stand on the mountaintop together and no one will speak of my country, but we will speak of our world." Unquote. So my friends, the real question of America's destiny that now confronts us is one which has been forced upon us by the four Rockefeller brothers, David, Nelson, Lawrence, and John D. III, pursuing this objective spelled out by their father. It is essentially the same question that faced President Abraham Lincoln just over a century ago, whether or not the United States of America was to be destroyed. The threat then was one of destruction by dismemberment and fragmentation, and it was met by the use of Federal powers to maintain the Union. The threat today lies at the opposite extreme of over-centralization of power, and it can be met only by reasserting individual and state powers and rights under the Constitution. To explore the radical change of direction in Americans' destiny that is being plotted and manipulated by the four Rockefeller brothers and their allies, I want to talk about the following three topics today. Topic No. 1 how individuals are being reduced to sacrificial pawns in the Rockefeller program to protect and advance their own interests. Topic No. 2. How nations are being maneuvered into war and destruction as part of the Rockefeller scheme of progress. And Topic No. 3. How we are being pushed and tricked into discarding our heritage of freedom to accept Rockefeller Dictatorship. Topic No. 1. One of the strangest and most sensational kidnap episodes in history began on February 4, 1974, when a young lady named Patricia Hearst 
was kidnapped from her apartment in Berkeley, California. Her kidnappers soon identified themselves as a radical group called the Symbionese Liberation Army, or SLA. Thus began a nightmare of impossible demands, tape recordings, merciless publicity, shootouts, and unrelenting pressure behind the scenes for Mr. and Mrs. Randolph Hearst. On April 3, 1974, a tape recording announced a new twist that Patty Hearst had joined the SLA under the new name Tanya, and a few days later Tanya helped rob the bank as if to prove what she said. Just for good measure, a few days after that, Tanya was seen spraying bullets from an automatic rifle to cover SLA member William Harris as he left a store where he had allegedly been shoplifting. Soon the SLA was all but wiped out in the spectacular shootout in Los Angeles. But somehow Tanya just happened to be elsewhere watching it all on television. Tanya had escaped, and for more than 16 months, in spite of an alleged manhunt nationwide by the FBI, she and her SLA companions, William and Emily Harris, reportedly continued to evade capture. But finally, on September 18, 1975, the manhunt suddenly ended as abruptly as it began. Tanya and the Harrises were found right in San Francisco, no less, where it all began, and the trio were quickly rounded up without much fuss. I mentioned briefly in monthly audio letter number 7 that the SLA was a CIA operation and that its purpose, in which it was successful, was to bring about a Rockefeller takeover of the huge Hearst Empire. But now I believe the time has come to tell you more for two reasons. First, I fear for the life of Tanya, the impersonator of Patty Hearst, who is currently in custody. And second, I am now convinced that Mr. and Mrs. Hearst, Patty's parents, do not know that the girl captured last September is an imposter. Until very recently, there were indications that they knew this, but were keeping their silence about it to protect the rest of their family. For that reason, I have refrained from discussing the details of the Patty Hearst case other than to tell you about the Rockefeller takeover of their holdings. The Hearsts, of all people, have good reason to fear additional CIA-engineered reprisals against them, and I would never want to usurp their personal prerogatives. But I have at last obtained evidence which convinces me beyond question that Mr. and Mrs. Hearst are still in the dark, and it is for their sake and for the sake of the life of the girl, whoever she is, that I am about to reveal the truth in the Patty Hearst case. For I truly believe that the truth, even when it is unpleasant, is always to be preferred over lies, no matter how pleasant or convenient. And only the truth can provide the basis for justice to be done. The Hearst newspaper chain first incurred the wrath of the Rockefeller brothers three decades ago when they led the campaign to expose major abuses spawned by the Rockefellers. For example, it was the Hearst chain that publicized secret Congressional testimony showing that America's atomic secrets were handed over to the Soviets, not stolen by them even before our first atomic bomb was finished, and that the Rockefellers were directly involved in this. This was very easy for the Rockefellers, by the way. The world's first controlled nuclear reaction was achieved at their own University of Chicago late in 1942, and the Manhattan Project worked outward from there. 
Even this name, Manhattan, for the Atomic Bomb Project was chosen as a subtle acknowledgement of the real bosses of both atomic energy and the nation's power centers in Manhattan, the Rockefellers. The Rockefeller interests launched savage counterattacks on the Hearst Empire, using financial and other means to force many of the Hearst newspapers out of business, just as they are presently strangling the star here in Washington by means of an advertising boycott. But the Rockefeller brothers never forget, and their ultimate goal was to eventually take over complete control of those portions of the Hearst business complex that managed to survive the initial Rockefeller counterattacks. Patty Hearst was the pawn they used in order to do so. The first tapes after Patty was captured were full of fear and urgency, and relayed crushing demands to her parents as conditions for her release. Mr. Hearst was coerced into incredible outpouring of his resources in a giveaway program, only to have the demands from the SLA keep rising until they became unreachable. Then after a period of silence came the first Tanya tape, claiming that Patty was disgusted with her parents and was joining her captors. But, my friends, the real Patty Hearst was no longer alive by that time. On February 28, 1974, just 24 days after her abduction, Patty was drowned in a bathtub by three SLA men, against whom I am told Patty put up a tremendous fight. Afterward, cremation was used to prevent any chance that her body might be discovered and identified. This is common practice in covert CIA executions, by the way, and I am reliably informed that this was also Jimmy Hoffa's fate after his abduction late in July 1975, which I discussed in my monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 3. The rest of the charade up until the capture last September of Tanya the impostor who is alleged to be Patty Hearst had just one purpose, to maintain unmerciful pressures on the Hearsts in order to crack their control of the Hearst interests. And the prime pressure point in this campaign was Tanya herself, who was used in order to convince the Hearsts that their daughter Patty was still alive. Any loving parent in the position of Mr. and Mrs. Hurst would cling desperately to the hope of having their child return to them, and the Hursts are no exception. So long as she was not captured, there would be no chance for the Hurst to discover Tanya was an impostor, and by allegedly being spotted from time to time the assurance was maintained that she was still alive. Thus, in the best Rockefeller CIA traditions, Mr. and Mrs. Hearst were tricked into believing that they were bargaining for the life and for the return of their daughter Patty even after she had actually been murdered. This deception continued for nearly a year and a half until at last the CIA achieved by way of the SLA what the Rockefellers had sought all along, a transfer of the control of the far-flung Hearst interests to the Rockefeller brothers. As soon as the arrangements were made for this transfer of control, the bargain was for Tanya, alias Patty, to surface, and surface she did. This was a simple matter since the FBI had known even before Patty's kidnapping that her abduction was planned and was aware of her whereabouts and that of Tanya, Patty's impersonator, throughout the so-called manhunt of 19 months' duration. The Hearsts gave up practically everything in a deal to get their Patty back, and the last, most critical part of the SLA, SLA operation was to convince them that they had gotten what they had bargained for, namely 
their daughter Patty. Tanya therefore had to be captured and convinced the Hearst that she is their daughter, Patty, and the psychological profiling techniques which were so useful in watergating Richard Nixon and his aides out of the White House were also used on the Hearsts in order to minimize the risk that they would see Tanya as a fraud. The Patty Hearst Tanya manhunt was dragged out over 19 months, and during that entire time the Hearsts were subjected to cruel psychological pressures of all kinds for the purpose of damaging their capacity to perceive anything from a normal perspective. During most of that time the Tanya charade was utilized to get them gradually accustomed to the idea that if they ever did see Patty again she would be drastically changed by her ordeal and therefore not like they remembered her. And Tanya, for her part, was herself schooled and psychologically programmed in order to be as convincing as possible in brief encounters with her Hearsts after her alleged capture. Even in spite of all this, the whole elaborate trick almost broke down when Mr. and Mrs. Hearst first got to see their alleged daughter after her capture. She was even more different than they had imagined, and afterward Mrs. Hearst sadly said to the press, quote, that girl just isn't our Patty, unquote. She apparently meant it in a figurative sense, but her words unconsciously expressed the literal truth. But the natural deep-seated wish to believe that Tanya is Patty apparently won out, reinforced by all the inhuman pressures which even now still rest heavily on the Hearsts. For the moment, the Rockefeller brothers have won their gamble. They have fooled the Hearsts. Now there remains just one more detail to be attended to. The girl herself, Tanya, the girl who is alleged to be Patty. She has now completely served her purpose, and it is her turn to be double-crossed. The one thing the Rockefeller CIA agents cannot permit to happen is for Tanya to be released and have extended contact with Mr. and Mrs. Hearst. It is one thing for Tanya to hoodwink the Hearsts into believing she is Patty during brief encounters under tense, unnatural conditions in unfamiliar surroundings and against a two-year backdrop of nightmarish events. But it would be quite another matter for Tanya to return home with the Hearst and continue to convince them she is their daughter during the course of an ongoing relationship in what should be familiar surroundings. The Hearst would, without any doubt, soon see that something was terribly wrong about the girl who was supposed to be Patty Hearst. And that, my friends, is why I fear for the life of this girl who has called herself Tanya in the past. She cannot be allowed to go free, and now that her job is finished as far as the Rockefeller Brothers and the CIA are concerned, she has become a liability for them. If she is very fortunate, she may just be locked up, out of sight, and the key thrown away. But I fear for her life, because if she is silenced, the deception of the hearse will have been sealed permanently and any chance that she herself might someday blurt out the truth will be ended as well. If this happens, Tanya will have gone the way of Lee Harvey Oswald, Jack Rumi, and many others before her. The Patty Hearst case is a tragic example of the way in which individuals are seen as nothing more than pawns to be pushed around on the chessboard of power by the Rockefeller Brothers and their helpers. But you do not have to be a Hearst or a Nixon or a Hoffa to become a Rockefeller CIA pawn. I revealed in my monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 5 for October 1975 that electronic psychological programming techniques are being used by the CIA to program people 
like human robots, to do all kinds of things they normally would not do. There is now a rising demand by the CIA for people who can be made to run involuntary errands for them this way. Busy as they are with bombings, terrorism, and other projects, to warp America's bicentennial to Rockefeller purposes. But people vary considerably in their receptiveness to such programming, and a catalog of highly receptive individuals is therefore of great interest to the CIA. Therefore the CIA has secretly aided in the establishment of a chain of centers which offer to help you quit smoking, lose weight, or stop drinking almost overnight. What they use are psychological te uh, conditioning techniques which are related to the very much more advanced techniques used by the CIA. And if you go to such a center and your therapy reveals a very high susceptibility rating, your name, with or without the knowledge of the particular center you visit, will end up in a special CIA file for a possible future use. If you contemplate using such therapy, you should be warned of this hidden liability. If you have already used it, I can only suggest that you exercise due caution whenever you must receive medical care, especially if hospitalization is involved. If possible, stick with your family doctor or others you know you can trust. On March 24, 1976, President Ford announced still another effort to treat us as pawns, and this time every man, woman, and child in the United States is intended to be involved. I refer, of course, to the trumped-up swine influenza threat and the proposal to inoculate everyone against it. The stated medical reasons for this totally unprecedented project are so patently flimsy that everyone from the World Health Organization to individual doctors all around the country have sharply questioned what is proposed. Many doctors have gone so far as to openly ask what the real political reason for it is. So unconvincing is the medical basis for it. Meanwhile, the Rockefeller-controlled major media are beating the drums in favor of it. Some groups have questioned whether perhaps something sinister is to be added to the vaccine. But while this could be done, it is not the underlying reason for the swine flu program. The whole swine flu swindle is an elaborate cover-up, the most diabolical so far of the truth about the horrible CIA radioactive plutonium superpoison which is now contaminating the entire southeastern portion of the United States and is even beginning to show up now in traces nationwide. This is the poison which was stored in the central core vault of the Bullion Depository at Fort Knox. As I first revealed, in my monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 5, October 1975. As part of the Federal Government's cover-up, they made matters a thousand times worse when they deliberately dumped it into underground streams under Fort Knox during January, as I have previously reported. Now they are beginning to realize the hideous extent of their folly but instead of honest remedial action, their response is still cover-up. First, the swine flu campaign began by alarming everyone with its alleged threat. Then it was pointed out that even those who do get the vaccine run a considerable risk of getting sick anyway due to side effects. And to cap it off, officials expressed public doubt by the end of March that it would be possible to produce and administer enough vaccine to inoculate everyone by late this year when the government allegedly fears a swine flu epidemic. The whole thing is intended to condition us all to the idea that this will be the cause if and when Americans start dying like flies 
in some areas soon due to poisoning from the spreading CIA plutonium poison from Fort Knox. And just for good measure, preposterous stories have also found their way into print recently alleging in effect that plutonium is practically harmless based on records which have suddenly been discovered recently about people who were injected experimentally with plutonium years ago. It's all a big game of look over there, and you, your children, and your loved ones are the pawns in this cold-blooded game. Topic number two. Down through the centuries, War has always been an evil which the vast majority of individuals have feared and wanted to avoid. Yet we all know they keep right on happening. And why? Because they also have always been small groups of men who have viewed war from a very different perspective. To them, war is just one more tool to be used in both the exercise and the expansion of their own political and economic power. In the 20th century, wars have become bigger, more frequent, and more savage than ever before. For nearly three generations, one place or another around our planet has been aflame with the fires of war and revolution. And now, having already suffered two world wars, we are stepping across the threshold of a third. What's wrong? It's said that from a little acorn a mighty oak will grow, and where war is concerned, a very important acorn was planted shortly before World War I. The trustees of a tax-exempt foundation, known at that time as the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, which involved an alliance of the Rockefeller and Carnegie interests, spent a full year debating just one question. Is war the best way by which to alter the life of a nation? And incredibly, my friends, the conclusion they decided upon was yes. Shortly thereafter, World War I began. President Woodrow Wilson, a Rockefeller puppet, was enthusiastically supported by the trustees of the Carnegie Endowment when he got America into the war. And on at least one occasion, they even sent Wilson a telegram urging him not to let America's involvement in the war end too soon. They did not want to cut short all those desirable changes in America that were to be expected as a result of our involvement in that war. Desirable according to their criteria, of course, not yours or mine. By the time World War II was brought about by the Rockefeller interests and their allies, this philosophy was even more entrenched and more powerful. The United States was deliberately dragged into World War II by means of Pearl Harbor with the active help of President Franklin D. Roosevelt. And as in World War I, World War II was also deliberately dragged out longer than necessary in order once again to bring about major changes in national life, not only in the United States, but in other countries as well. For details on this subject, I refer you to the recent two-volume audio book talking tape, number seven, entitled The Tragic Truth About the FDR Era recorded in February 1976 by Colonel Curtis Dow and myself. FDR was Colonel Dow's father-in-law, and Colonel Dow speaks from personal knowledge about many very important things. Three years ago in my book, The Conspiracy Against the Dollar, I pointed out the very intimate connections that link politics, economics, and matters of war and peace. And in this regard, I tried to call attention to the very powerful, important new economic and political forces now emerging in Asia. And I ended my book in these words, and I quote, 
if the new Asian forces are not understood but are met with ignorance and arrogance, then the world will indeed be headed not for a generation of peace, of which President Nixon has so proudly boasted, but for World War III." Unquote. In the same context, I refer to the crucial importance of the Panama Canal, and in June 1974, on a radio program in Dallas, Texas, I relayed intelligence information I had just received confirming that the Tamara airfield in the Republic of Guyana, next to Venezuela, is now ringed with atomic missiles aimed at the Gatun locks of the Panama Canal and at cities in the United States. But as usual, the federal government still refuses to this very day to permit an honest investigation of this life and death situation. And by the way, Tamara Airfield is being used by Cuba nowadays to ferry its mercenaries and supplies to southern Africa for more wars there. Tamara Airfield, 25 miles outside Georgetown, Guyana, is larger than our Kennedy Airport in New York. In my monthly audio letter number six last November, I was able at last to reveal the whole grand strategy of the coming war, including the opening rounds of the Middle East and the succeeding stages by which it is presently intended to mushroom into a full-fledged world war. And on April 19, 1976, just five days ago, the United States government gave the official green light for the Middle East War to begin. On that day, April 19, the White House quietly dropped its previous opposition to all outside military intervention in war-torn Lebanon. All the blocks in the Middle East war plan are now falling rapidly into place. On March 13, 1976, Saudi Arabia sealed its own doom when the negotiations with American top oil people in Panama City, Florida, ended in an agreement for Saudi Arabia to buy the remaining 40% of the assets of Aramco, the four-company Rockefeller oil combine that operates in Saudi Arabia. Oil Minister Sheikh Yamani revealed that the takeover transaction would be carried out all at once within four to six weeks. What they do not realize is that after the Rockefellers get their money, the oil wells will be bombed out of existence by an American Lebanon nuclear strike emanating from the Sinai. The White House go-ahead signal April 19th to get the ball rolling in this war came exactly five weeks after Sheikh Yamani's announcement. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Forster of South Africa injected his country into the Middle Eastern fray by making a secret visit to Israel two weeks ago for the sole purpose of obtaining military hardware in exchange for raw materials. By doing so, he also left his country open to infiltration by a client state of the Rockefeller-controlled CIA. On top of that, he inflamed the Arabs and most all black Africans. So South Africa has jumped from the frying pan into the fire, and Henry Kissinger, on his African trip, will be handing out millions of American dollars to the so-called Liberation Front, who are bent on liberating Rhodesia and South Africa for the Rockefellers. And so the black leaders here and abroad will be used by the Rockefellers in their attempt to help their ally, Soviet Russia, do the dirty work for them in Southern Africa for the rich mineral resources there. The war situation we face, my friends, is increasingly dangerous 
and as far as the first stages of it are concerned, eminent. But before I leave this subject, I should add that we must now not allow ourselves to lose our resolve to halt this trend into disaster. I believe we can still do it, and we must do it. Until recently, Rockefeller propaganda sought to create false optimism about our foreign policy, military posture, and other factors in our national strength. But now people are waking up. They know something is wrong. So now we are entering a new phase of defeatism propaganda designed to ruin our morale so that we will just lie down conveniently to be conquered. An example of this on the domestic scene was a statement by Senator Frank Church last summer to the effect that Americans would have no way to resist in the event of a takeover by a dictator. So vast are the spying abilities of the federal government. This alleged warning, greatly exaggerated for effect, came from one of the earliest accomplices in the cover-up now in progress about the hideous CIA plutonium poison. Other voices are also lending their weight to the defeatism campaign. But on an international scale, one voice stands out above all others, that of the allegedly exiled Soviet author Alexander Solzhenitsyn. A recent quotation from Solzhenitsyn, which is a condensation of practically everything he publicly says today, is, and I quote, I wouldn't be surprised at the sudden and eminent fall of the West, unquote. Then he goes on regularly and at great length to build up an image of Soviet power, supposedly matchless in its propaganda and quickly becoming invincible militarily. He speaks of all this in disapproving terms, thereby sounding as if he is on our side. But the image he paints, my friends, is still one of defeatism for us, an eminent victory for our real enemies. He spreads seeds of hopelessness, not of hope, as some would have you believe. Such hopelessness could cause the West to be defeated from within, just as France was in the 30s and early 40s even when he admits for a moment that the West could still save itself from complete takeover, which it still can, my friends, he follows that up by putting down any notion that he actually expects that to happen. But Solzhenitsyn is very powerful in his use of words, and he has become a Pied Piper with patriotic, freedom-loving individuals and organizations following in his train. What will be the effect, my friends, if a year or two from now, with war and economic and political chaos on all sides, Solzhenitsyn should dramatically announce, the West is doomed. I'm going back home to the home of communism, the wave of the future. Might not this be the crowning stroke the Soviets need to collapse remaining patriotic morale in the West? Apparently, the Rockefellers and their Soviet allies think so. That's why their controlled media are now giving Solzhenitsyn tremendous publicity. And according to highly reliable intelligence information I have received recently, this is the real purpose for which Solzhenitsyn was sent to the West while other Soviet dissidents remain unable to follow his path. Whether Solzhenitsyn himself is consciously involved in this, or whether he is simply the victim of psychological profiling and programming, the defeatism he is spreading could prove to be one of our most mortal enemies. Remember, it was Lenin who also was in exile in Zurich and who longed for the collapse of Russia. 
So why could not Solzhenitsyn, who also is supposed to be in exile in Zurich, long for the collapse of the West? Topic number three. If you have one of the newly issued $2 bills in your pocket, please take it out and look at the back, which depicts the signing of the Declaration of Independence in 1776. The seated gentleman, uh, that is number seven as you count from the left, is supposed to be Robert Morris, according to the original painting of this scene by John Trumbull. Morris was then a wealthy financier who gave his all for the cause of freedom and independence and ended up penniless as a result. In his original painting, Trumbull honored Morris for his sacrifices in the cause of freedom by depicting him prominently in a shining light with a proud look of determination on his face. After all, if it had not been for Morris, the ragtag army of the United States might have collapsed for lack of funds. On the new $2 bill, Morris's important role is also symbolically acknowledged, but by people who want to undo the freedom which his sacrifices helped bring about. On the bill, Morris is darkened into obscurity, just as our unseen rulers want to obscure and blot out our freedom. As I have mentioned before, such subliminal propaganda messages and signals are all around us such as the state flag postage stamps, which say Bicentennial Era, code words which refer specifically to the so-called Second American Revolution program of John D. Rockefeller III. In more direct ways, too, Rockefeller propaganda is designed to advance their program toward dictatorship. On April 18, 1976, the Rockefeller-controlled Atlantic Richfield Oil Company known as ARCO, A-R-C-O, began taking out full-page ads nationwide for something they called the Tricentennial. It pictures a mock American flag consisting of 300 white stars on a field of blue with a number 2,076 in computer-style numerals against a field of red. And below that, it encourages you to write and tell what changes you want to see in America without even a passing nod to the fact that you might like some things to remain as they are. The crux of the whole ad is contained in the words, and I quote, in about six months, we plan to gather your responses, analyze them, and make a full report on what we found out, unquote. And, quote, we'll make sure it reaches the people who are in positions to consider and act on it, unquote. What people do they mean? The Rockefeller brothers and their helpers, that's who. The new ARCO Tricentennial campaign is nothing more or less than a replacement for John D. Rockefeller III's National Committee for the Bicentennial Era, which was forced to shut down a while back after its bicentennial decoration ad of a year ago was exposed as the kickoff for the secret new Rockefeller Constitution. Meanwhile, Rockefeller progressed toward implementing their secret dictatorial New States of America Constitution is proceeding as fast as they are able. During the first week of this month, April, a so-called critical appraisal of the United States Constitution was held in Philadelphia with over 100 attendees representing universities, business, labor, civil rights groups, the Judiciary, Congress, and others. Prominent names from the Watergate investigation were on the list, including Henry Ruth, Jr., who served as the Watergate Special Prosecutor in the final phases. Can you imagine? Labor was represented by Victor Gottbaum of the AFL-CIO, and Stephen Schlossberg, General Counsel of the United Auto Workers. On the business side were board chairman of three corporations, J. Irwin Miller of Cummings Engine Company, John D. Boyd of the D. Boyd Group, and Fletcher L. Bryan of Copper's Company, an especially outspoken proponent of ideas which appear in the Rockefeller New States Constitution. The presidents of the Council on Foreign Relations, the League of Women Voters, 
and Carmen Carls was there, as well as the executive director of the American Civil Liberties Union and the co-director of the admittedly radical anti-capitalist People's Bicentennial Commission, Jeremy Rifkin. Top representatives were present from Time Magazine, the Federal Reserve System, and the American Bar Association. Nearly a dozen federal judges were in attendance, plus a retired Supreme Court justice and the head of the General Accounting Office himself, Elmer Staff. It's hardly any wonder that Professor Marvin E. Wolfgang, president of the sponsoring American Academy of Political and Social Science, confidentially declared at the meeting, and I quote, neither the Congress nor the White House can ignore what we say here, unquote. And this is no idle academic comment, my friends, because on May 12, 1976, the Philadelphia World Affairs Council, a unit of the Council on Foreign Relations, plans to come to Washington to begin seriously pressuring Congress in preparation for formal adoption of both the dictatorial Rockefeller New States of America Constitution and the treasonous Declaration of Interdependence first introduced last October in Philadelphia. Meanwhile, the four Rockefeller brothers continue working to position themselves to take full command of the dictatorship they hope to create soon. Frontman Nelson is rapidly emerging now with the publicity campaign I mentioned he was planning in my monthly audio letter number nine two months ago. And he's pouring out all the stops. On one hand, to one audience, he says, forget the past and let's look to the future. But to another audience, he professes to be an unabashed believer in, quote, the old-fashioned virtues, unquote. Can you imagine? He says living by example is his key religious precept. But, of course, he doesn't mention any of the examples of his past record that I revealed for you in monthly audio letter number one. Most recently, he has even begun lashing out at old friends and allies, even close family friends of long standing, such as Dr. Dorothy Fostick of Senator Henry Jackson's staff, in his consuming ambition to harness for himself the so-called conservative sentiment that is now sweeping across America. Nelson Rockefeller and his brothers are still playing their deadly end game of tactical maneuvering to meet contingencies, trying to time political and economic events here in the United States to mesh with fast-breaking events overseas in the build-up for war. To this end, my latest information is that two prime options have now been developed for Rockefeller's takeover of the presidency. And as usual, I reveal them in the hope that by doing so, such actions may be necessary, may be taken to prevent their happening. Option one, may be exercise of the forces for Middle East war that have now been unleashed progress very rapidly, leading to war there and a declaration of emergency here before the conventions this summer. In that event, President Ford may be removed from office one way or another before the convention, in which case Rockefeller will become president and serve out Ford's term until January 20, 1977. But, my friends, option two is now at the top of the Rockefeller preference list. I can now reveal that Nelson Rockefeller plans to use his infamous 25th Amendment to the Constitution again, but in a different way. He has already made Ford to agree that he be his vice presidential candidate. Rockefeller now plans for Ford to be nominated for president and himself for vice president, regardless of what happens in the primaries. Then after the convention, the plan is for President Ford to be incapacitated for one reason or another, thereby activating Clause 4 of the 25th Amendment of the United States Constitution. 
Under this clause, and I quote, a majority of the principal officers of the executive departments, unquote, who are now 99% Rockefeller client followers, will send a written declaration to the President Pro Tem of the Senate and to the Speaker of the House of Representatives that, and I quote, the President is unable to discharge the powers and duties of his office, unquote. Thereupon, Vice President Nelson Rockefeller, who himself is the President Pro Tem of the Senate, quote, shall immediately assume the powers and duties of the office as acting President, unquote. Now get that, acting President. Rockefeller plans to achieve this on or about September 19, 1976. And in this capacity, under the provisions of the 20th Amendment, he will serve, quote, until a president shall have qualified, unquote. But that could be indefinitely, because part of the plan is also to call off the elections because of the very abnormal circumstances and attendant confusion, all of this paving the way for acceptance of their dictatorial New States of America Constitution by a national referendum. And if you think such a thing just couldn't happen, just remember, the banks were closed and the people's gold was confiscated by FDR in 1933, and the people accepted it because of the abnormal circumstances. In World War II, Japanese Americans were rounded up and herded into concentration camps, an unthinkable act, yet it was accepted due to the abnormal circumstances. And would you have believed just four years ago that both a vice president and a president could be hounded out of office and be replaced by two appointees? My friends, our founding fathers realized that the day might come when our government, both federal and state, would fail us in their constitutional duties to represent the people. It was for that reason that they included Article 10 of the Bill of Rights. Often it is called the State's Rights Amendment, but it should be called the People's Rights Amendment. It reads, and I quote, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people." Unquote. I repeat, reserved to the people. So we have to look to ourselves. And it has now come down to that, to you, to me, to all the people of the United States. It is time for us to highly resolve, as did Abraham Lincoln, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Until next month, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you. And may God bless each and every one of you.